This is really a continuation of the, uh, the comment about the U being the important component of this whole process. We're going to move now to the, uh, the role of the navigator in the whole thing and where the forecast belongs on the nav table. And I'm pleased to introduce Ralph Naranjo. Ralph is a, a fairly well-known sailor in this area. He did a circumnavigation with his wife and children a number of years ago. Uh, spent some time running a boatyard. Spent more time, I think more time, at the Naval Academy as the, as the Van der Sar chair. Um, he has also recently uh, completed a work of love, I think. <laughs> took, work of toil, that's it. That's it. Um, on, on seamanship which uh, has received some very, very good reviews. It is a, a, we're going to say a dense read, and that's not a pejorative. Better um, than a dense author. That's, that's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of material. <laughs> so we're very pleased to have Ralph with us this afternoon. Thank you. With the cognoscenti that's gone before me, and me, the uh, aspiring student, I've learned a few things today, quite a few, and I hope you have. So the first thing is, let's take a look at a little quiz. How many feel this Jim Cantore map is sufficient for our needs? <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. Even when we um, add more data and a couple of lows and some frontal boundaries, doesn't quite make it. But as I said earlier, this bad weather move safely offshore is uh, <laughs> One of the things we need to think about. I have to say that um, I'm a real fan of the Ocean Prediction Center and the products they put out. And this talk is going to be infused with how to put them to better use. I love wintertime. And it's a good reason why we don't go sailing or aspire toward Greenland during the winter months. A couple of things. The tidal block, very important to know whether you're looking at an analysis or a forecast. How many know the difference between analysis and forecast? OK, quite a few hands came up. The, anal the analysis is really what's going on now, basically observational and um, numerical. But it is not what the future will hold. It's what you see now. And when you see a number like 42 and 48, and it's a wind wave chart, that's not a good sign at all. <laughs> the Brits do a pretty good job of it, too. And if you take a look at this chart, we see hmm, 938. Oh, that's a real hole in the atmosphere, very close to a 1042 millibar high. This is pretty sobering. Never have I seen quite as many orphaned occluded fronts and pieces of fronts and so on. How many would like to be in Norway at this point in time? In a high rise in Oslo, perhaps. But when you look at other nations' charts, one thing that stays fairly consistent is the four millibar spread between um, isobars. So if we look at that yellow arrow, that's the Mount Everest of pressure gradients. That's really a steep, steep um, part of the grid. This is um, also an interesting means by which we can uh, uh, calculate uh, the wind speed. It's a geostrophic um, uh, chart or, or um, calculation that takes into consideration the polar view of this chart. So in other words, in the steep point of this gradient, we would see about 80 knots worth of wind. And now I'm a skeptic. I love to find buoys and other things that are going to help tell me whether or not that was factual. So what latitude is that? That's about 60 degrees north latitude, the red dotted line. Unfortunately, it's about as high as the scatterometer read would go. So I looked at this synthetic aperture radar read of the surface. And whoa, that's a scatterometer report of this same period in time. Those little pennants, what, do a, what does a pennant mean? 50. And if we look at the end of the scale, the black area is greater than 50. So that's approximately 600 miles 
or so. Now I guess it's a little more than that. Yeah, about 600 or so from the center of that low. And we still have uh, 50 plus knots of wind. So the tenant of what I'm talking about is it's not just the wind, it's the waves and the sea state that's created that affect us and what we're concerned about. We have a static understanding of what the weather's doing at a given time. But we need to have a dynamic thought toward what's happening down the road, what's going to happen. The best thing about sailors, your sense of wind speed, wind direction, and the fluctuations, the oscillations, where it's trending, and it, all it takes is that level of interest moved on into how the weather is changing on a um, near-term and longer-term basis to give us uh, some real value. Because whether you're a cruising sailor or a racing sailor, you need to know what's going on now, and you really want to know how that is going to trend toward the future. When's the next? change coming through, and what's it associated with? People would say, ah, oh, I'm not going to see, so I don't have to worry about conditions like this. Right here is Oyster Bay, and at the other end is Greenwich. It's 40 knots of wind plus on Long Island Sound. That's 50 knots in the South River. It's not a matter of uh, whether it's going to happen. It's a probability situation. It's going to happen happen less frequently on Western Long Island Sound and on the South River in Annapolis, but it will happen. The thing here is no fetch. Remember fetch, that's the area in which that wind field is blowing over, and fetch is what causes us some concerns, to reef down and so on and so forth. So heavy weather is a relative term. For some of us it may be that borderline of mid-range of gale, 35 moving into 40 knots of sustained winds, gusts will be higher. For others, it's a lot more significant. For me, I'm more concerned about sea state. When we have a situation where the winds are light, 15 knots here maybe, but the swell is hiding the top sides of this small bulk carrier moving by us, what do I want to know? I want to know where the storm is that's creating this wind, where am I, and how do we proceed down the road? Good way to do that, again, is using Ocean Prediction Center um, product. And very often, I'll look at this wind wave part of the uh, uh, forecast and see it's, OK, we are in feet, if you notice. T at times, it's in meters. In other words, when the map shows a larger area, uh, it's referred to as a smaller scale chart, and it's in meters. We also have a nice way to tell swell direction and um, the wavelength, um, which associates with where that energy is traveling. It's now well beyond the fetch range. It's moving out in long swells, as Frank had so finely defined earlier. And right now, if you take a look at the scale to my right, you can probably tell me who has the most exciting time at the beach. <laughs> How about Spain and Portugal? Well, to ground truth that, I have a fellow who makes a living picking where surfers go to get big waves. That's Portugal, Madeira coast. Right now, these heavy seas are what pound that shoreline area and what make the entries into La Rochelle, France, and so on. So exciting. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about accruing the understanding. I'm going to give it just a quick flashback. Naranjo started decades ago with hair on his head. And a wife who was more excited about Morsi quarter ton racing than I was. I was more excited about exploring the local Channel Islands, so on and so forth. We got a lot of small boat experience, and we both came from families who had been boating on Long Island Sound since we were kids. But my game plan didn't work. I said, you know, Lenore, we've been to Point Conception. We've been all the way to Mexico, Channel Islands, 
let's go to the next island, Hilo, Hawaii. She said, this is a 26, 3,000 pound boat. You go ahead and take your friends with you. I'll fly over. And that's what we did. In a 21 day passage to do 2,300 miles, you have a lot of time to think about what you don't know. And I didn't know an awful lot. I had one of my friends with a Zenith transistor radio, and he kept pointing it at Hawaii. And when the planes would fly over, he felt comfortable. I was a celestial navigator. Anyway, long story short, the voyage worked out. Lenore flew over with two young kids. We began um, what I call exploring the tropics. It took hold. A year or so later, moved aboard Windshadow, did a year's worth of coastal cruising, and then set off on a voyage around the world. Spent five years, never returned to the US, never had anyone else aboard as crew with the two kids and the parental drama. Our friends came to visit, but not to make passages with us. Anyway, heavy weather? Yes, once in a while. Maybe five really bad days when you'd rather trade the boat for maybe a potato farm in Idaho or something such as that. The point is, I'm not reminiscing here, but I do want to point out something of interest. Crossing the South Pacific. Have one burning, what I call, bit of knowledge, pass it on, and it's been mentioned already, that is, stay in the seasonal climate pattern that makes sense. In other words, when I was, you know, early into sailing, it was, you weren't in the Caribbean during the summer, you didn't make passage during the, the hurricane season through ocean basin, so on and so forth. Made sense. So when we were crossing, leaving Tahiti, it was well into March. S hurricane season down there called the cyclone season was over, and it was a nice, easy trade wind passage. Till that came up. The good news here is that a category three storm uh, in Australian context, amounts to a category one storm to us. That's only 80 knots worth of wind. Uh, anything of that nature is, as mentioned earlier, uh, not of uh, significance. It's the fact that that's going to undo you. So what happened? Well, there was the start. My game plan was I would get closer to the equator. In other words, let's get to the equator so that the hurricane's not going to be progressing up that way. But the door was closed off. We're in the southern hemisphere. The storm starts up there, well north of us. That's out. What did I have for communication capability? Very little, but I was a ham radio operator. So what did I do? My friend in Hawaii got a phone patch for me to Fleet Weather Central. Talked to the Navy. They had a new thing called GOES satellites. This is 1977. So what did they say? They said, well, that storm is going to change. We see it in the upper atmosphere, the eye wall replacement, and the course is going to change. It would move southwest first, but they said, don't count on it. It'll tack back toward the southeast. So what we did is we made that right turn. We kept, it was probably 100 miles away from uh, the outer bands of, it was a fairly large diameter storm, not, not too deep, but had we not done that, had gotten that information, our track and the storm would have coincided in a very ugly place. So information is king. The ability to get information, and at that point I said, from here on, the game plan is, let's get more information than WWV storm alerts. How many know what that is, WWV? We all used to tune that in because it gives you very accurate time. It's a atomic clock time, and we'd all need that for checking our chronometers during the celestial navigation days. But look here, we have 2.5, 5, 10, 15, 20 megahertz, where you get a couple of minutes worth of storm warnings. And in the land of the blind, the one-eyed person is king. Having some information is better than no information. But today, it's a different story. And I'm not, not by any means a Luddite. I abide by 
technology and certainly um, talk about its merits. Black-browed albatross doing foiling. <laughs> Most of the time, we deal with lack of wind rather than too much wind. So to be able to figure out with your um, weather sources that magic area where 10, 15 is at least available. There's nothing like sitting in the middle of an Atlantic or Pacific high and it becomes hazy. And you look up, you can't see the stars, you look down in the water and you can see the bioluminescence of the plankton. Well, that's great for the first evening. But spend a couple of nights there and you wish, gee, a Nordhaven trawler sounds pretty good. Okay, back to basics, and I still abide by the barometer, an understanding of the relationship between pressure and wind velocity. What happens, as we've seen in the past, when the pressure drops, we see increases in wind. Red is the gust, blue is the sustained wind velocity, and very often the more abrupt the drop, the more wind velocity there is. And what you will also see, not in this one, what can we say about the climb out, the increase in barometric pressure? You often see quite a bit of wind at that time. We don't hear, which is due again to the particular weather system involved, but we'll see some of these later. A precipitous change in the barometric reading means wind. You've heard it many times today. I won't beat that bush any further, but uh, the faster the rate of change, the more important things become. I'm really a cloud guy because the clouds tell us a real story and it doesn't take a genius to recognize it. These lads understand that there's problem at risk, time to fold the chairs and so on and so forth. Here's a quick rundown, a thumbnail. When you start seeing broken cumulus, blue sky, first thing I ask is where's the wind coming from? And if I have some wind out of the west-northwest, it's likely the coal front's gone through. We're not seeing big castellations on the top of the cumulus cloud. They are not um, what I call heading uh, up to an afternoon crescendo. And it's likely that's the forebearer of fair weather. These alto cumulus clouds, remember the talk earlier about a warm front approach and that we uh, first see some cirrus, cirrus stratus, fibratus, various high-level clouds, these move in next after you've seen the halo around the sun and so on. Sign of a warm front approach. This is called my morning exercise. What's the uh, red sky in the morning? And here's the reason why. We'll see, looking toward the east, the disk of the sun as it rises above the horizon. If you take a close look, at where your wind is, if the wind is veering and we're in the northern hemisphere going south to southwest, it's likely you're in the warm sector. You will see the start of a buildup of cumulus. If the disk of the sun acts as an example of what the tops of the cumulus are doing, whether they're growing rapidly or, in this case, kind of moderate. The reason for the red sky in the morning bit is if the sky's red, there's already a reasonable cloud deck there, and it's already east of you. So that weather system is moving over you, normally moving from the west to the east. Obviously, cloud to ground lightning doesn't take rocket science to say, hmm, that's a cumulonimbus, and I'm either in a single cell thunderstorm, a cold front, or some other untoward situation. Sometimes, we'll see a fairly ominous deck of cumulus and stratus left behind. It looks like it might be threatening, but if we look to the west and it's bright and we see a little clearing, why would I assume that, gee, if I have a west-northwesterly, it's clearing to the west, things are going to get good? Because most times, and I say most times, the weather's coming from the west to, toward the east. So understanding the sky, especially on the approach of a weather front, when the cirrus and cirrostratus, cirrocumulus, uh, and a variety of other genus and species of cirrus clouds start moving quickly. 
speed of movement is also an indicator. Very often when you're under the jet stream or that magical um, 5640 uh, is south of you, you'll start to see clouds move faster. It means that there's a little more vigor aloft. Chesapeake Bay thunderstorms are normal occurrence, as they are in many other areas. The real question is how much development is taking place. When you see the lumps of cumulus rise in a building phase, once you see that anvil and the shearing off of the cloud top, that's pretty much that cell has spent itself. We have serial and progressive developments of thunderstorms in which there is a lot more energy transferred. We end up with outflow boundaries and all kinds of other things. We know what that chart shows us, and it's a nice job of Jen Clark, years, uh, many years uh, developing it. But what it tells us is that if you're into thunderstorms in the stream, that heat um, factor plays a big role. I won't dwell on that again, just reinforcing concurrence with what's been said in the past. All right, so we're going to talk about mainstreaming forehandedness and how the navigator or whoever is handling the weather on the boat has a couple of jobs. Job one, discern what's happening. Job two, communicate it with the rest of the crew. You don't want to have one person the epicenter of knowledge, just as you don't want one person only understanding how to work the communications gear. Wrote about this quite a bit in uh, The Art of Seamanship. And I had the real fortune over the years to sail extensively with uh, Rod and Eddie Grafe on Puffin. And one thing, we talked about synoptic scale, mesoscale, uh, macro and micro. Rod was a, knew nothing about what I term the meteorology, but I don't know anyone who knew more about discerning how much punch a squall was going to have than Rod Stevens. He somehow could picture which were the um, tight uh, spots to get through, and he was the master of feathering. Many a Bermuda race is um, <clears throat> handled in the stream and how people get through it, and feathering is one of the techniques. All right, merging the forecasts and what goes on on board a vessel. Local country for you, Jim. San Juan de Fuca and um, uh, the Pacific Northwest. Beforehand, know what's going on. The good news and the bad news is that the best time to gather weather information is when we have a nice Wi-Fi link with our home system or we are on cell coverage before we leave shore. So try and make sure that you have downloaded everything. But here's one thing. Don't value all that data three or four days out. You want that scratchy looking uh, weather facts download or whatever you can get that's current, not something that's a long way off. Now, this is going to date me, but if you're transiting to other areas, there's still validity in pilot charts and there's still plenty of validity in sailing directions and other information. The irony in sailing directions, the older the issue, the better, because it was more in an era of sail. When we were in New Zealand, I had a bunch of old uh, sailing directions from around the world that were probably 1905 or so, still had the sailor in mind, not necessarily the steamship. Understand that this is for the neutral phase of the La Nina El Nino scenario which greatly affects us. There are some climate changing variations that naturally occur on really wide cycles. The most extreme is an ice age, whatever, number of years. The smaller scale ones are the North Atlantic decadal oscillation and El Nino. We've talked about it a bit. What we have is a east to west trade wind that blows religiously. How many people have done a passage in the South Pacific um, in the trade winds? It's easy sailing. It's enjoyable sailing because if you hit it at the, the particular time when the trades are in place, that's a great thing. 
What happens is, here we have upwelling because the water is literally being blown across the Pacific. Here we have water that's literally a couple of feet higher in Australia, New Guinea, so on and so forth. But when we have a El Nino event, what happens is those great trade winds die off. The upwelling stops. See the red that represents warm water? It moves much more closely to South America. The fishermen in the Galapagos have heart failure. The water warms up. The tourists love to swim in the Galapagos during El Nino events but it has far more uh, implication. This loop, the Walker circulation and trade winds, uh, shorten. And trade winds, now what we'll see is the beginning of this subtropical uh, jet stream that brings a lot of wet and a low pressure predominance in the Pacific, but brings this wet weather through uh, to our part of the world. So the, at least you should be able to think that the La Nina uh, and El Nino, El Nino we have much warmer water along the South American coast during um, um, the La Nina event, which we're just on the tail end of right now, brings cold water uh, and strong trade winds. The trade winds start to die, and why is that? Because the tropical weather, you get much more convective activity, a lot higher incidence of um, tropical storms and cyclones in the mid-basin of the Pacific, and you even have what I call a shutdown in those trade winds. Good example here, El, um, El Nino event, lots more convective activity moves into the um, eastern basin of the Pacific. During in the La Nina, the heavy weather tends to be in the cyclone season off Australia. It's important for trade wind passage makers, obviously, if you're going to cross the South Pacific and count on trade winds and have no winds, it's a time to think about diesel fuel tankage. <laughs> Won't get into the details, but uh, the latent heat we talked about earlier is affected when we have an El Nino event because, let me go back to this, cyclones increase um, in our part of the world during um, an, uh, a La Nina period. The La Nina period uh, has much less shear, wind shear, in the Atlantic. So the Atlantic hurricane season uh, tends to be greater. Was it this year, La Nina event? Did we have a busy hurricane season? Absolutely. Other oscillations, this... Um, North Atlantic oscillation is not temperature, it's pressure. The Greenland low extends a bit further south. You see uh, its influence further south while the Azores high retrenches. And on the flip side, just the opposite happens. It affects weather in the US. It's a very significant situation. Whether or not the Gulf Stream is influencing this or what the influence is, it's beyond my ken. And uh, maybe during questions, we can get into that. Let's talk about sailing toward bad weather and the decisions made. This particular Volvo race, the Volvo vessels and crews had a harder time getting around Cape Hatteras than they did getting around Cape Horn. There was more vessel damage, rig damage, sail damage. And the reason is Cape Hatteras is often underestimated. And since it's close to home for us, we need to have some thought about what's going on there. I always look at the Coast Guard headquarters, and it'll tell you a lot about what kind of weather exists in the given area. What's this? This is the rollover capable 47-foot motor lifeboat. Very expensive craft, and what it does is obviously get out in weather conditions that are pretty significant. That's Oregon Inlet. Another good bellwether as to where bad weather exists is talk to my son, and to a certain extent myself. We're avid windsurfers, kiteboarders, and so on, and Hatteras can start to look like Hawaii when low pressure systems move through the area. 
So the issue at hand is not just understanding SAR operations, but understanding why Hatteras has this reputation. It's a promontory where many low pressure systems move off the coast and start to drop in pressure. It's a shoal area where we have diamond shoal, frying pan shoal, and a variety of other shoals extending 10 miles or more offshore. And what else is in the proximity? The Gulf Stream. So what we have is we have the confluence of bad news. We're going to give you a little bit of a look at an incident that is, still stands today as both extremely tragic and also uh, a contrary scenario. Particular vessel, uh, Flying Colors, with a four-person crew, all experienced sailors, including the pro-captain that had run the boat for a number of years, were coming back from the Caribbean, May 7th. Now, that's not real early. That's not March, not April, May 7th. And here's what happened. This is the first chart. This is on May 1st. It's a 96-hour chart. So it's a long way out. We take a look at the 96 hour. We have a low that's on this uh, stationary front. Is there anything really worrisome about that? And that's what it's supposed to be on May 5th, 96 hours out. Next day, another 96 hour out. It even looks a little better. There's the rum line. What do we have? We have a fairly slack gradient. This low is going to develop into a gale, but it's already uh, out to sea. And we have a little bit of a uh, ridge forming down in that high pressure system. Still, how many would say, boy, that's a sign of real trouble lies ahead? No, it's not. Next day, we have a low that's now shown on this stalled boundary, stationary boundary. How, how long has that been in place? Several days now. That's been consistent. What does this term stand for, DSIP? Dissipating. So the low pressure system is going to dissipate. Now, we are, how many, how much time do we have? Um, we're, um, let's see, look at it from my machine here. With a, yep, we're getting close to the fifth. Okay, still, we're at a 24 hour um, forecast now. We have a new low, but it's well offshore. This uh, stationary low down here, how deep are these lows? They're not too deep. In fact, they're higher than the mean temperature, but we're starting to see this high pressure become dominant up here. It's stationary. How about in this area off Hatteras? What does Hatteras look like? It looks pretty clean at the moment, but a day later, here's the bellwether. Probably from a 500 millibar chart, the forecaster on duty at this time probably said something's going on here, developing storm. Now, in the Hobart race in 1998, there were a number of competitors who said, oh, I didn't think that was going to be bad at all. It was reported as a storm, not a gale. Which is worse, a gale or a storm? A storm, no question. And when they say storm there, developing storm, um, that is wind velocities 47 knots on up to get to hurricane force. Well, was that a change? Yeah. Now you say, is that going to come about next day? This is May 7th. Hurricane force, it's not a really deep low, but what is the high? 1034, we talk about gradient in that particular scenario. This is a weather system that has a very interesting history. The Hatteras buoy here had a report 12 hours um, before, maybe, maybe 18 hours before, of three foot seas under 10 knots of wind. 12 hours later, 65 knots, 30 foot seas. How can that happen? Well. It was an extremely tight gra a gradient caused by that high ridging down and the low deepening. But look at the direction of movement of this low pressure system. It's going southeast, which is not the usual, east, northeasterly, but it's heard of. But now we have retrograde movement, and that low is doing 
um, a rotation around under the high pressure system. And not alone that, but what do we have up here? The National Hurricane Center decided to claim it as the first tropical or subtropical uh, storm of the season. Probably after discussing with Ken and um, um, uh, Frank uh, yesterday, it wasn't a warm core storm, it was probably a cold core storm, but nonetheless it was named Andrea. It hung around for a little while here and then deteriorated, but that's a long life period. Baraclinic lows last five days, sometimes a little bit more. This cyclone or uh, extra tropical low, whatever you want to call it, was not alone bad news. Four vessels. Two were driven ashore. One was a, a Sun Deer 62, big boat. Um, another was a 43-foot um, Beneteau that knocked down, took the rig out, when the rig came out, took half the cabin out, and they got the life raft launched, um, tore the top tube, so only one tube left. They, the name of the boat was Sean Seymour, three people aboard. The three people on board are right there when the helicopter came to get them. Flying colors disappeared completely. This was a very anomalous low, but not unusual to have a um, significant event in early May. The n capability we have now with satellite technology, improved modeling capabilities, as well as probably three or four other things that either Darren or Joe or whomever is here from Ocean Prediction Center can make much more clear. But the issue at hand is this was a hard one to get out of the way of, even if you had knowledge. A um, friend who owns Ticonderoga, his captain heaved two off Georgia, spent three days in a heave two position until this thing got out of way so they could carry on. But any further north in Georgia, and you'd be back in the maw of it because of the way it's circled around. So when we get into passage planning, watch out for the shoulder seasons. This still was a shoulder season scenario. That high pressure probably had a lot of cold, dense air in it, and that adds fuel to the fire. cruise I was doing with some friends, we went from Newport outside Pollock Rip. We were headed up uh, to Newfoundland, but we were going via the Magdalens. It was going to be a lovely cruise, but what intruded? Bertha. Well, Bertha took the nasty track right up the coast. And we knew about it. We were listening to the forecast. We were trying to decide where to hide out. Where are you going to find shelter? So I was on watch with another friend of mine. The rest of the crew is down below doing the chart work. They had the charts out. They're looking at what's going on and where to go. And we came off watch and we're really impressed. The crew is fully engaged. But what was going on? Buckley was looking for the French restaurants in <laughs> Magdalen and other parts along the way. And in truth, where we ended up was a place called Canso Strait. Blue like hell all along the coast as Bertha went up. But where we were, how's that for a nice, good anchorage? Look at that little B-40. Fortunately, we were tucked in tighter. And the reason we were tucked in tighter, it looked like Bertha was going to go right over us, the remnants. What was going to happen to the wind? It was going to go right around on us, and that's what happened. There is no fetch between here and here, and the B-40 was looking just fine there. But once that wind went around, there was probably 10 miles of fetch going across the straits there. And, uh, he was in a world of hurt, fortunately had the engine running, had the dive mask on, and was taking the load off the ground tackle. A lot of chain, good, um, I think he uh, had a bruise or a plow at the time. Um, but it uh, survived, and um, we were all happy about that. Let's take a quick look here at, um, what's the date on that? Okay. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. Well, 
I was doing a hypothetical. I was down in Florida. There were a couple of uh, people in Lake Worth Inlet ready to go to the Bahamas. And this was the forecast. And I was looking at it. And um, again, not a meteorologist, a what I call weather map user. I'm looking at a high that's developing pretty significantly. Um, and I say, well, I wonder what it looks like up above. So here's the 500 millibar. See where the 564 line is? That looks pretty clean down here. Is th does that look like it's any kind of foreboding? No, it doesn't. No, no um, trough coming down further. But you have to keep in mind that um, it's not just one chart. The human eye and the human brain works pretty well, too. So here's what's going on offshore. The charter guys are happy, smooth seas. Even this old Jim Brown trimaran was out for the day. Well, that's OK. It looks like it's, um, it's going to be a fairly uh, benign period. But by the afternoon, things start to blow up. What was the only thing on the surface chart that said maybe we're going to see a little more wind? The gradient in that high pretty tight in the high. So we go on. By beginning the next day, uh, you know, it isn't quite smooth seas. It's starting to do what happens in Florida in the wintertime. The Bahamians know all about. How many have heard of a rage in the Bahamas? Sure. Blows like hell out of the Northeast. It comes over the little Bahama banks. And by this time, the only happy uh, um, uh, folks um, are the people still sitting in port there. Um, I decided I'll take a look at the Gribs. And um, uh, the NAM shows this little pulse in here at 25 sustained. The uh, GFS, about the same. They coincide. But it's showing nine hours down the road. We're starting to see a lot of 30 knot wind barbs. Don't say to yourself, gee, 30 knots. I don't have to worry about it. 30 knots in a situation where there is a tighter gradient in, the, in a high pressure system, you're now seeing the wind increase with what? Pressure not decreasing, but pressure increasing. So what does it give you? Well, when it's spring tide time, and remember we had a perigee moon at that point in time, you're going to get maximum tidal currents in the inlets. You're going to see a lot more uh, tidal current. And uh, it's probably not the right night to head for the Bahamas. Next morning, breezes up pretty good. May only be 30 knots of wind, but the only guys that were happy that day were the kiteboarders. Um, going downwind is one thing. Crossing the stream and going to the Bahamas, nah, not a good day for it. So. Take advantage right now of the morning watch. Maybe you do it on the weekend or when you're semi-retired, such as uh, I'm, I think I am. One of the things to do is to take a look at Ocean Prediction Center first. You'll see a wealth of information. Even that Brit uh, Met Office chart I found on the Ocean Prediction uh, links site. National Hurricane Center equally as important. There's a quirky thing on the National Hurricane Center now. A, we, they're doing a nice thing, and they're looking at disturbances. Pre-tropical storm, the, the disturbance are these little x's, so on and so forth. You see that? 10% to 30% chance of development to a uh, named tropical storm. However, you can see when there are no x's on the chart, no disturbances, Big sign up here, it says, no disturbances. Great. But on the chart can be a category three hurricane or a tropical storm. It's just there are no disturbances. So if you partially load, download this information, you, know, you don't want to miss the big solid eye with the wings on it. Here's something I've become pretty uh, fascinated by, the probabilistic storm prediction center information. Traditional um, Norwegian model with great legend capability. You learn an awful lot from that. Three a day, 72 hours, I think, in another month. 
there's going to be a 72-hour chart. For me, being able to see the um, surface chart as well as a 500 millibar chart is good. We see the difference between winter conditions, summer conditions. What can we say about the gradient? Goes away, pretty slack. You get, oh, you find a stall front or this little low here, the low is 1018 and it's dissipating, oh well. But usually by this time you start wondering when you'll see the next tropical weather. Common summertime, cumulus conditions, a barometer that the, you don't wear the bearing on the needle out from jumping back and forth. It stays, it might drop to um, about 1,000, and you may see 1030 in the summertime. But the huge perturbations aren't there. Think about the different scale of the charts. This chart and the 500 chart are different scales, but we can still compare the area, what's going on. How do we do it? You pick a lat lawn. So I looked at the lat lawn of where that low is, and I looked at a lat lawn of where that um, trough in the mid-atmosphere happens to be, and I just superimposed them. And you can see, boy, there must be some involvement here between this uh, westward-leaning um, uh, upper-level um, trough in the ice heights and the surface uh, weather on the ground. Surface forecast, 500 millibar, they're the bread and butter of your weather uh, knowledge. Lee Chesno is a master of the 500 millibar, and if you want to find out what um, is connotated or connoted by, by the two, he makes the upper level and the surface work together. I don't, you know, authors always pitch their own books, not somebody else's, but Lee has a great book. If you have a chance to read it, it's well worth doing. The Ocean Prediction Center is moving into a new and productive realm. What goes on is, with modeling, you take observational data, put it into that box of computation, run an initial forecast, and then run that back through with some variance. You're doing ensemble forecasting. What you're doing is you're doing some what-ifs on the forecast that was originally generated. What you're trying to do is upset the smoothing that takes place in just a single run through. Um, at the same time, the grid is getting smaller and smaller where there's plenty of observational data on land, but not as much at sea. We would love to see, and I think a number of us in this room at the Stakeholders Ocean Prediction Center meeting said, boy, it would be great to see automated Voss uh, uh, weather stations put on ships. Take the load off the deck crew and have some funding possible there to put the buoy information that you see on a seaman buoy or whatever on a ship and give us more of the at sea data. It goes down into the basement through the computer system and we end up with this combination of machine-driven model data along with forecaster opinion. I do know that I am uh, diminutive in my understanding and knowledge compared to Stan. Stan tells me co-amps, GRIB information, piece de resistance. I, I don't know which are the good GRIB files, which are the, the, the let's say, less efficient uh, information, and it varies from one weather system to the next. That's why forecasters are so important to me. Probabilistic information is interesting. This simply means greater than 15 knots over that area, the red area is 90% or higher likely of seeing greater than 15 knots. 25 knots, same idea. When it gets to yellow, it's 70%, green's 50%, and blue, I'm not sure what it is, but 34 knots and above in that little area. What does it give you? It gives you both an idea of where the area where heavy wind is going to be, but also the likelihood of it occurring. Is it more valuable to me than what I see on more of a deterministic view of uh, the weather? Maybe not, but the two together 
make a lot of sense. I'm still a little questioning on the Storm Prediction Center usage. Here on thunderstorms, not, this is the least likely, 40 knots and hail, small hail. Hmm. Marginal conditions, 40 to 60 in one inch hail. Well, it's marginal not in intensity, it's marginal in likelihood. So we have to figure out how to put this to use. You know, it's, um, most of these will blow the barn down, but not likely you're going to experience it. I like these in coastal areas, especially the Gulf, and even up in our area here. They overlay the colors. When you start seeing the warm tones, the pinks and so on, that's time to tie things down. In these forecasts, you're looking aloft as well as on the surface. The purpose is to show wind shear, because that's a big deal in the tornadic thing. We sailors don't suffer quite so much from what um, areas in the Gulf where there's lots of verticality shear taking place. Fortunately, they show these types of information. And here's one to keep in mind, outflow boundary. It talks about where you're going to see strong gusts coming out of a uh, thunderstorm, or you've heard the term derecho. It means inline winds that get intensified by having either a serial or progressive set of thunderstorms sending out gust front microbursts that carry um, that strong wind well away from the thunderstorm. The point here is, when you look at the Doppler radar and see the thunderstorm, what are you looking at? Are you looking at the wind? No. You're looking at the water vapor. And not what, you're looking at the hail and the water in the column. There are times when it's the wind front, the outflow boundaries 10 miles away, maybe even more, in really strong outbreaks ahead of a bow echo. So that outflow boundary, how they started, the radars got so good that they could see insect, birds, and probably uh, you know, uh, somebody's wash blowing across the ground. And they literally could see that debris on the outflow boundary. Okay. Storm Prediction Center did a great job of highlighting a tornado watch, bad weather's coming um, in the Gulf, and informed sailors as to what was going on. The Dauphine Island regatta didn't take heed, and it was a big loss, tragic event. So um, how we inculcate the weather information is as important as what it stands for. I think my time's up. What I'd like to say is whether you use a um, service such as SiriusXM, uh, which gives you a variety of information. Make sure the information is what you're looking for. Text can be gotten from a variety of ways. Jim brought them up, and I say that it's great warning information. I match text with graphics if I can get the graphics. But very often, you try and acquire what will give you the most information in the shortest amount of time. You can have a weather consultant. Um, you can um, gear up. The main thing is when you're trying to download lots of data, you have to do that to the spreaders to make it all work. Thank you very much.